Thank you. Thank you, thank you. All right, let's do this one last time. <laughs> I'm Edmund, and for the past two years, I've been the one and only inclined technical lead on Spider Earth. Well, you all know the rest of the story, but maybe what you don't know is how we use Blender in Spider Man Across the Spider Verse. So, thank you for the Blender Foundation for making this event happen. And now we'd like to introduce our other speaker, Sharon, FX animator on Spider Verse. She will be sharing her experience doing short work using Blender as inclined artists. And Monica, FX uh, animator, who will be discussing Blender usage in the animation department. So first, I would like to start with a little bit of a background. At Sony Picture Imageworks, we have an in-house developed pipeline where so many different talents work on so many different shows, both CG animated and live action. And this polyvalent modular approach is what allows us to tackle unique looks never seen before, such as the look of Spider-Verse. I remember watching the first Spider-Verse in 2018 and being blown away by how much I couldn't understand how it was made. The blend of different mediums, the different rendering techniques, the stylization from all departments was really coming together and pushing what it means to tell a story in a stylized way. So we were really excited what we could do to push that even further in the sequel. So Sharon and I, we both work in the FX department. But the FX department on Spider-Verse is made of two teams. There are FX artists that do smoke, destruction, and all kind of effect animation, and there are incline artists that focuses on generating and ingesting inclines. So what are inclines? Inclines are curves in 3D space. And in, into the Spider-Verse, we use them a lot on face and hands in order to make you feel like characters are hand-drawn rather than 3D rendered. It's a stylization layer that makes the final image much more imaginative. With the power of incline, you can simplify silhouettes with outline. Or you can add more detail by doing the wrinkle on the ends or the underlip shadow. And we really like this idea, and we wanted to do more. But incline, drawing at every frame, making sure the outline matches the silhouette can be very, very time consuming and tedious. So we knew that if we were to do more, we needed to simplify and automate the process. In the end, we were quite successful, so it's almost 90% of the, all the shots in the movie that received inclines. We, at every shot, we were generating incline based on camera perspective and character performance. For the face, we had machine learning inspired library based workflow where we would predict where the incline on the face should be based on camera perspective instead of drawing it manually. But we were also doing full body and clothes. So for instance, we have the incline on Peter's dress that are kind of make you feel like fur. We have the overshoot on Miguel's shoulder. We have Obi pepper line around his body, and Obi is covered in, in incline, and Ben Reilly is also receiving incline from all department. And all those layers of incline are reacting to how the character moves, depending on how fast and slow is moving, the incline is behaving differently. And that kind of emulates the process of 2D animation, the traditional process of drawing character. And we were also doing environments. Uh, the 290 world is receiving inclines that are very architectural, based on camera perspective, with a lot of line work that is overshooting from the surface. We were doing actually incline everywhere, props, crowds, vehicles, even some effects. So we had to wrap everything into command line tools so we could just deploy incline on any shot without having to open any software. But we still had a lot of artistic control. At any shot, we could open the file, tweak some parameters to get exactly the design that we wanted. But one thing that we realized is that for some shots, it was not enough. We were really missing a human touch. Just the idea of putting a couple of lines here and there was really missing. So one thing we haven't tried yet was drawing the incline ourselves. So at first, we had one of our 2D freelance artists to draw 2D sketches into a 2D animation software. And we will export the sketches as curves and project them into 3D space, animate the curve. And we really like this idea. So we wanted all our in-house 3D artists, 2D artists to do the same. 
So we had them draw annotation in each view, which is the same process that clients and directors use to annotate during reviewing process, which was not the most uh, artist-friendly workflow. So we opted for a more uh, elegant approach, which is using the Grease Pencil tool from Blender. It was uh, also an the animation department kind of expressed the need to use Blender in the same way. So we joined development efforts. And in the end, the workflow was similar. We would open Blender, import some camera, backplate, shot asset, and we will draw the incline, export it back to Maya or Houdini for processing and publishing. So now I would like to welcome to the stage Sharon that will be talking about this process in the FX department. All right, is my mic working? It is. Hello again. Um, seeing as that was an awful lot of information, I'll start us off with a fun fact. <laughs> I actually don't need these. I wear contacts. All right. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I am going to backpedal back to the beginning of Spider-Verse 2 for a bit. So at the start of production, we were still using the inclines tool from Spider-Verse 1 and only those. That was the one that allowed us to predict where the lines were going to go and tweak them to our liking. But because this was the second movie, we had new characters, new worlds, and new art styles that were more ambitious than the last. Uh, our main culprits were the villains, Vulture and the Spot, who not only gave us a hard time in the real world, but were menaces in the story of Spider-Verse. Right, so our first culprit is the vulture, Mr. Da Vinci Blueprints himself. Um, he's comprised of sketchy quill pen strokes on old worn parchment, quite literally like an ancient ink drawing that's come to life. And it's a traditional art style that's really difficult to capture with 3D tools. Next up we have the spot, who starts off as chaotic, and then for those of you who watch the movie, descends into even more chaos. Um, he's got a really deceptively simple design, but it evolves over the course of the story to visually represent his growing power. Um, his key points include the splotches that make up his portals, or his holes as he likes to call them, and the sketchy accent lines that go from scribbly to scrawly depending on his emotional state. Now the key point of this is that both these characters have a lot of hand-drawn design elements that are difficult to capture with our existing 3D tools, and that is where Blender came in handy. Now as previously mentioned, we would use Blender for shots that needed a more human touch, and we would go about that by getting artists such as yours truly to use Grease Pencil to draw directly onto the model, and then ship our work off to the rest of the pipeline. So to help us get a better idea of what that would actually look like, um, I'm going to do a shot breakdown. But we're not going to start here. We are going to start here. So this is a screenshot of what a file setup might actually look like in Blender. And I'm going to play a video that kind of maybe shows what our process would have looked like as well. So what's going on here is that we're just going through the frames that have already been drawn. And what's actually going on in this file is that once we receive our work from our lovely and talented animators, we'll pick up everything, throw it into a blend file, and start drawing on it like so. Now, on an artistic note for spot, we tend to focus on his spots, his joints, the outlines of his body, and everywhere else that may need a little more care and attention. And uh, we will just draw frame by frame like so. I will note that this shot was done by our lovely and talented Brittany Corbin, who is our resident spot and vulture expert. Now, just by looking at the video alone, you might be thinking, are you not just tracing over the animation? And you know, why get artists to trace something when you get a machine to do it? You may just tell me to use Toon Shader at this point. Now, you can already see here that a lot of the lines are being drawn are not traced. Um, they're not really coming from anywhere except for our own brains. And the second piece of evidence that I will raise you is that Spot's model is bald. It's barren, it's naked, it's empty, and we have to put in a lot of those details by ourselves. Now, you could still argue from a corporate standpoint that you could use 3D um, computer-generated tools to generate the lines instead of having to draw them by hand. However, with the technology that we have right now, it's not really possible to recreate 2D drawing principles. And what I mean by that is that when an actual comic artist inks their panels, um, they're not really running their pen around an outline. It's more like they're defining the features of their characters and their worlds using the ink. It's less like tracing and more like shading with line work. There are deliberate decisions being made about things like line weight, which is how thick the lines are being drawn and where the lines are being drawn. As you can tell from that little example on the left, a bunch of well-placed lines can define shadows on an otherwise flat object. Also, hand-drawn lines just look really cool, so I don't know why I'm making this argument. Now, um, of the first pass of a shot might look like this, and you can see it looks kind of, the 2D lines are lagging behind the 3D animation because the 3D model is constantly moving around the space, as is the nature of animation, which brings us to our first dilemma, which is getting 2D lines to keep up with the 3D model. Now, the obvious answer would be to make like traditional 2D animators and draw in all the in-between frames, but at that point, is that not just rotoscoping? 
It's not, and I'll explain why. So while it's true that we do draw our lines in screen space, I feel like that's where the similarities end. Because with rotoscoping, you're kind of tracing on top of an end product on an isolated layer, and the lines do not exist in the 3D space. But what we'll do is that we'll project our lines onto the model and stick them on there like so. And this does two things. One, because our lines are now attached to the model, it actually follows the animation, which means that we don't have to draw every single frame anymore. And secondly, because we do get that nice bit of interactivity, it helps to marry the 2D and 3D aesthetics a bit more seamlessly than just comping flat footage of lines on top of a flat render of a 3D model. Now the thing is, because we are projecting the lines from camera screen space, if the character turns away from the camera or moves around a bit too much, we do have to redraw the lines on those frames. And you might be thinking, oh, well, that still seems like a lot of work. It's not, we have something for that. So we have a way to sample data from keyframes to interpolate the missing links. And what I mean by that is say at frame one, you pick up your pen, you hand draw the lines in that frame, and you move on to the next key pose, which in this example is conveniently at frame three, and you pick up your pen and then you draw your frame again. Now traditionally in 2D animation, we would draw what is called an in-between frame at frame two. But thanks to the wonders of technology, we can actually Frankenstein frames one and three, effectively drawing the in-between for us. Now if this sounds really familiar, it's because Blender does have an interpolation tool already, but ours is different, I promise. <laughs> we needed a tool that was cross-compatible with other programs in our pipeline, things like Houdini, Katana, Nuke, so on and so forth. And we also needed a tool that took 3D animation into account when generating the interpolations. Now how this works is that it will use the frames at the beginning and end of the range as parents to create a child that is a mix of the two. So where the model starts to move, it will begin to erase out the lines on the previous frame, and then um, sampling from the next frame, it'll begin to draw in um, while taking the 3D animation into account. In 2D animation terms, it's kind of like tweening, but instead of using transformations to get from point A to point B, the machine is actually recalculating everything. Um, now the cool thing about this workflow is that it's not limited to one frame. As long as the animation makes sense, we can interpolate between a whole range of them. Now to kind of help you guys get a better idea of what that would actually look like, um, I've traced over this shot. So the green frames are the ones that we would have drawn by hand, and the blue and the red frames are the ones that would have been interpolated for us. And as you can see, this does save us a lot of time and busy work. And on a show like Spider-Verse, time is very, very precious. Now, it'll go. <laughs> Not only are these tools major time savers and essential for 2D and 3D hybrid production, it's proof that Blender can be integrated within a mainstream 3D pipeline and exist as part of a larger production ecosystem. Or if I were to say it using tech buzzwords, cross-efficient cross-compatibility. Now, after shipping our work off to the rest of the pipeline and having it pass through many other people's talented hands, the final product will look like this. And I will leave that up there for people to admire for a bit. Now, <laughs> I'll move on because we need time. Uh, in my opinion, as both a 2D artist and a 3D artist, I really like this developmental direction because it involves traditional 2D artists. I feel like there's a love for hand-drawn animation that's still very much alive, and I'm glad that we found a way to incorporate that craft in an industrial production pipeline. I think when we think about innovation in animation, we're thinking VR, we're thinking AR, we're thinking procedural nodes and photogrammetry, and all of those things are groundbreaking, amazing things. But I also think that innovation is not only looking forward to the future, but also learning from our history and moving forward together with old crafts and moving, evolving with them. As I would like to say, I think the pen is as mighty as the keyboard. Thank you, and I will be handing it back to Edmund. It wasn't as good. Um, <clears throat> we use the same idea to also cover the smoke with line work. From the artist's perspective, the workflow was the same. Open Blender, draw the line work, export it to Houdini. <clears throat> the only difference was on the technical side, because we couldn't project on any geo and follow uh, the geo, because there, there was no geo, it's a volume. So instead, what we did is that we compressed the velocity of the point cloud, uh, of the volume as point cloud, and we adjected the line work using this point cloud. So this idea allows us to cover the most destruction-heavy sequence of the movie with line work. And th with that said, that kind of covers Blender usage in the FX department. So now we'd like to give the floor to Monica that will be discussing Blender usage in the animation department. <laughs> Oh, 
Okay, now animation. So I was in the animators department, I'm an animator too, and uh, we thought we could talk about how did we end up using Gris Pencil in Spider-Verse and also what did we use it for. Okay, so we all know that Spider-Verse is full of like visual effects that really like give impact and power to the movements, but these effects that are directly connected to um, yeah, I'll put on my slide, maybe. Uh, to the characters' movements are made by the animators. So already we had a tool for that, which is the Inklines tool. It's the one that we used for the first movie, and then we improved for the second one. And that tool is basically you just um, create a rig, uh, you had a stroke, and you have it with its different controllers, and you can move it around the scene, you can parent it, you can deform it, you can color it, you can do like a lot of stuff. But it's still a rig to do a drawing, so it's not that you know, intuitive. I mean, how are we supposed to do stuff like this? This is so beautiful. This is like so organic. This feels hand-drawn because it's actually hand-drawn. It's Chris Pencil. So how do we end up using it? I'll tell you the story. It all started in the beginning of the production. We were like really three people. One of them, oh, sorry, I forgot about a slide. Yeah, you can see here a comparison between what is the ink lines that feels more graphic and controlled and the grease pencil that feels more organic. I guess you can see it, right? Okay, sorry, the story. How did we end up doing that? Uh, there was a guy, the man, the legend, it was Siggy. He's a lead animator on Spider-Verse. He was also friends with Hialti. That's how he knows Blender. And he didn't quite like the inline stool. He wanted something more intuitive. So he was like, hey, guys, Gris Pencil. So he started testing it by himself, like trying to import um, from Maya, that is the software we use, um, into Blender, the models and the cameras. And then he just draw and he exported it as images so Compo can use it. But then what happened? Who came into the scene? Pipeline and Pipeline say, hey, what instead of images, we just take this vertex and we export it as Geo. You have the image and you export, import it into Maya. So we have it in the actual free space and then effects and Compo can use it. Yay! And then we have that tool. When animators began entering the production, we presented this tool, okay, you have this amazing thing, and you can either use our Gris Pencil or the inline tool that I talked to you about. What do we use? Um, it depends on first looks, because as you saw earlier, um, the inline tool is more graphic, maybe you want something more precise, but if you need something more organic, you just use Gris Pencil tools. Uh, and also, there are people that are not familiar maybe with drawing, they're not that comfortable. So for them, it's, it's easier, the ink lines. But for me, or for example, for Sharon, that also has like a 2D tendency, we really appreciate being able like to actually draw like a human being, I don't know. And then more people became interested into this tool. We kept developing during the production, more people learned Blender, which is super cool, and happy ending, we have a tool. Okay, now that we have a tool in production, what do we use it for? I'll show you some examples. And all of these, of course, it's Chris Pencil. Smears, that's the classic one. You have the big smears, you have the small smears. Look at all these lines here. I mean, isn't it like easier to actually draw them? It is, let me tell you. Another example of smears, in this case, you can see how they adapted this Gris Pencil into the world's style. It's really cool. Okay, not only smears. Another thing that we do is that when we flip, you know, the classic flip, 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 we try to um, emphasize the impact of the shooting in the wrist to get a bit of pew. In this case, they chose to do like a big lines develop into particles. Now an animators can do particles. Oh my God, that's amazing. And more effects. Uh, for example, this is an impact on the floor, really simple. Well, when we animate this, we try to think about, um, this is a very visual movie. Uh, remember that it's coming from a comic book, and a comic book doesn't have any audio. So whatever you can emphasize visually, you do it. So a hit, uh, maybe uh, someone's attention. We try to do it with lines, with animation, with everything. So it's, it's a great resource. And then a Spidey Cat, where you can see a bit of smears, a bit of particles, a bit of everything, and it's so cute because it's Spidey Cats. And this, this is really cool. This is the first victory of Gris Pencil. This is from the teaser. It's the first, 
It's the first time people saw like response on Spider-Verse, so it's really cool. And other uses that we use it for. Um, sometimes the directors wanted to see like certain effects, like, okay, there will be water and fire and they're here. C can you do it? And I'm like, I'm an animator, I, I, I can do it. Effects will do it. So what we did was just draw them and like presented them that like a temp so they can see it. You like it? Yes. Okay, next. And then effects would do it. Another one, another use really important. A lot of people in Spider-Verse are really coming from, from 2D backgrounds. So what we like to do is, uh, instead of doing references, because sometimes you cannot do references. You know these shots with swinging and rah, how, how you film a reference for that. I'm not Spider-Man. Um, what we do is we block it out with drawings. So we can, you, what you can do is you just have your blender, you have your layout imported from Maya, and then you just parent your grease pencil to the character and you can simply like animate it, block it out with drawings, show it, does it work, does it not work? Super simple. And then, oh, I could talk more, but we don't have ma that much time. So um, as a conclusion, I just wanted to say that this comes to show that you don't need to change your, like, your whole pipeline to introduce tools like Grease Pencil, that it will definitely make your artist's lives better and your piece better. So that comes with you. And I'll invite my colleagues back to the stage. <laughs> All right, that's it for our talk. Uh, we really hope you enjoyed it. Uh, I would like to finish with a quick word of thank you for our, all the artists that contributed to the visuals and the tools. One thing that I want to mention about those amazing people is that when it came to recruiting for Incline, we will mainly look at the artistic background a lot. We, our goal was to make tools that anyone who likes art can just join and draw the Spider-Verse. Even if you don't know Blender, even, even if you don't know Dini, you can still join, learn as the show goes, and do all those things. And this is why Blender, a free tool that does so much while staying so simple to use, is such a good pick to do that. It just allows artists to join and spread their wings. Thanks again. Please check out those talks for more spider people. And we hope to see you soon in the Spider-Verse.